Thank you, Dale. I like you too. <laughs> Good to see you here. Uh, I can't help but think, being an ex-farm boy from Minnesota, uh, an ex-aerospace engineer, I was so left-brained at one time, my head tilted on one side. And um, I thought there was a, a natural explanation for everything, a natural answer. And then I came to Christ. I was kind of the consummate uh, religious non-believer. I, uh, I, I thought all those years I was a Christian. I, I got a little pin, says I didn't miss Sunday school for nine years. Nobody ever challenged me that I had to make some kind of a decision. I really look back at that as intriguing. I mean, how could I have missed it all of those years? And then I missed something else. I got into seminary, went off the pastorate, and, and something was still missing. I mean, heard all about the kingdom of God and, and the ongoing battle we have with the flesh in this fallen world. But why didn't they tell me about the kingdom of darkness? I mean, I was showing up, but what in the world do you do with it? I mean, I didn't have a clue. And when God called me out of the pastor to teach a Talbot School of Theology, I mean, I went there as a learner. Uh, I mean, there were some things I knew, but what I didn't know was profound. And uh, I started this class. It was a THM level class. That's the fourth level, elective. And we had 18 students, then 23, and then 35, then 65, then 150, then 250. Now, if you know anything about a seminary, that's a phenomena. And the reason was I was starting to see the lives of our students literally change. And, uh, and word gets around pretty fast. And during that time, I discovered myself who I really was in Christ. I mean, I may have known it theologically, but I didn't know it in the sense of Abba Father. Um, I really never had any horrible addictions in my past to overcome. I never smoked, I never drank, I didn't go out with dirty girls or boys, you know. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, it was just this innocent farm boy from Minnesota. Most offensive thing I ever did was smoke corn silk behind the barn one time. Burnt my fingers doing it. And, um, and uh, you know, and I thank God for that, to be honest with you. Uh, you don't have to travel every dirty road in this world to, to have the truth that will set people free. But I have sat, I think, with every hurting person, every conceivable problem over these last several years. But I started to see how God wanted his people to be alive and free in Christ. And, and you're kind of reaping the benefits of many, many years of struggle of, uh, of trying to get at the heart of this issue. I, I believe Christ was the answer. I believe truth has set people free. Push came to shove as a pastor. It didn't see any change. I'd read my Bible with them. I'd preach to them. I'd pray with them. And they'd go home the same. I remember one guy in my church. He was a pain in the neck to himself and his family and, and us. And one day he came to me and says, Pastor, I got this like voice in my head. Really? <laughs> now, not only didn't I know what that was, had I known, I wouldn't have known what to do about it. And I always kind of feared this scenario, because for years, I never was predisposed to believe that we're not in a spiritual battle or war. I just had no education or hardly any experience with it. And I, I always kind of feared this scenario. You're looking at somebody and saying, all right, I'm on to you. And then have the person say, who are you talking to? Well, I was just checking. <laughs> do you know what I mean? You don't want to look stupid kind of thing. And, and so I said, what do you do? What do you do? Well, I mean, after many, many years of study in school and a lot of years of experience, I said, it's, I mean, I'm getting more and more and more holistic in my thinking. Hopefully my worldview is becoming more and more like Scripture should be. I mean, you know, but I'm not there yet. And uh, none of us are. I got to tell you about three pastors, by the way. Uh, one was uh, a Calvinist, one was an Armenian, and one was charismatic. And they died and unfortunately went to hell. And uh, they were a little surprised to see each other there. Uh, so they turned to the Calvinist first, because they're always the most erudite, and said, Sir, how do you come for the fact that you're here? And they said, Well, I've always believed in the sovereignty of God and divine election. Guess I wasn't one of them. So they asked the Arminian. He said, well, I lived almost a perfect life until the day before I died. I really blew it. <laughs> Guess that's why I'm here. <laughs> so they asked the charismatic, and he said, I declare by faith that I'm not here. <laughs> now, chances are I just stepped on somebody's theological toes. <laughs> but that's not the intention. I say that for one reason. I personally believe this, and uh, I believe it now more than I think I did when I got out of a seminary that we're all going to arrive on the other side, be fully transformed in the presence of Christ, seen face to face, 
look back at our present theology and go, oops. <laughs> you think not? Think about that for just a moment. Isn't it profoundly arrogant to think that you have arrived, that you see everything perfectly from God's perspective? I mean, if we even believe the Bible to that extent, it would clearly teach us that you and I have one eye right now starting to slightly open. Isn't that true? Uh, I mean, everybody's going to come to a fork in the road as they pursue God. And, and I've just seen this over the years. You're going to come to that point, and you're either going to become more intellectual, more arrogant, or you're going to become more humble and more wise. And I, I think one of the, the greatest traps that you can get into is intellectual arrogance, thinking somehow or another you know it all and never arrived. Uh, boy, that's dangerous. I would have gone there, folks. That was my natural orientation of life. Uh, aerospace engineer, graduated almost at the top of my class. Math was my easiest class. Usually, usually and all through college I did it last because that was my easiest class. That's just a brain. Now, don't ask me to lead music or something. I mean, everybody has their own gifts and strengths and weaknesses. But, you know, with that, I could win a lot of arguments. No converts, just arguments. <laughs> I got out of that pretty fast, to be honest with you. But, I mean, I just, Western rationalism and naturalism is how I was educated. I would just very naturally gravitate towards that. I mean, I was in a bridge club where I could remember cards all week long and, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and, uh, but if it wasn't for God striking me down like Paul and, and taking me through a very broken experience, I don't know where I'd be today. I'd still be teaching, still respected, I suppose, but I wouldn't be an instrument in his hand. And after that broken experience, I didn't know anymore. I was just more dependent. And I don't think there's anybody in this room that knows any better than I do that I can't set a captive free or bind up the broken hearted person. Only God can do that. And um, when you stop trying to be the answer and, and start turning to God, and, and totally submit to him, then all of a sudden you're an instrument. And God will use you. And that's what we want to do is to help you become that instrument. And, uh, and so to introduce this whole thing, strangely enough, I'm going, we're going to talk about sanctification tonight, today, this afternoon. <laughs> so we're giving you two texts. I've tried to ask uh, those who come uh, to have already read Victory Over Darkness and Bondage Breaker. Our basic training for churches is Victory, Bondage Breaker, Discipleship Counseling, and Release from Bondage. I've given you a reading schedule. Probably you'll never follow it, but if you'd like to follow a schedule, if you're one of those kind of folks, uh, I would be one. Um, it's there so that you can kind of... Release from Bondage, you're going to find fascinating. That's a book I would probably give a professional counselor that is trying to ask, oh, how does this work? How can I bring this into therapy? But there's a lot of case studies in there, and that'll just flesh it out for you. And you, you get a, you know, the first seven stories are written from their perspective. And they're written, they're all chosen for a very specific purpose. And they're, 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 they're deep problems. Now, the second half of the book is, um, is new, uh, because the book first came out about 12 years ago. And we totally redid it. And the second half is a, is a therapist from Grand Rapids who tried to integrate this into her therapy and then uh, research was done on that. And, and it's just the second introduction is worth the price of that book to read uh, the, the two perspectives that are coming to bear. The researcher who got a side E from Fuller and a Christian therapist uh, and how they finally came together at the end. But, but it's, uh, it, it'll flesh out what we're talking, I think, in a very personal way for you. So um, please, and let me encourage you to, to keep up with the reading. Sanctification. It's God's will for your life. I have a little book out here in Divine Guidance. I said, guidance is one thing. God's will for your life is something else. If somebody asks me, what's God's will for my life? It's the easiest question in the Bible to answer. It's your sanctification. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. Uh, now separate that in concept from guidance, because God does guide us. And so you're trying to discern God's will. I said, that's easy. He wants you to become like him. And, uh, but in addition to that, God does provide you in career choices and, and this type of thing. And so we have some suggestions on, on how to do that in our book. But, but sanctification is God's will for life. I don't think amongst the evangelical uh, community, that's, there's any question to that. I, I've never heard anybody suggest that's not true. That what's beyond salvation, God's great work in your life is to conform you to his image. Agree? I mean, truth of the matter is everything you're doing in terms of worship, Christian education, discipleship, counseling, if you're not tying into God's great goal for that person's life, you're not working with God because he has no plan B. 
The truth of the matter is I've observed over the years, and I've seen it, and it happened to me. If, if you in Christian ministry are on some other pursuit for your own personal life, he will torpedo your ministry or your plans to get you back on that path. I've seen it. And sometimes it can be brutal, embarrassing. Um, but he has no plan B. I mean, you know, and, and once you become the person God has created you to be, then the doing all follows. It's always character before career, maturity before ministry, being before doing. Uh, but we're not wired that way, dear people. Not in this Western world, we're not. It's always doing, doing, do this. Here's this program, try this program, work this program. And no being, no connection. And I hope this all make more sense as we go through it. Now, one of the great privileges of my life, personally, is to write this book, The Common Made Holy, nine months. Uh, 400 pages book on sanctification, stuck to the shelf like glue. People don't read 400 page books. I guess I don't either. My wife does, but I don't. I just write one. That's silly. But, uh, <laughs> but the privilege was, was to do this with Dr. Robert Sosie. I think one of the most gracious, godly, gifted theologians. He's been on my board since the beginning. We've been friends. He's been my teacher, mentor, friend, you name him. And, uh, but it really didn't sell. Great reviews, but people just don't read 400 page books. So we uh, took the Cadillac and made a Buick out of it, and it came out in the book, uh, uh, God's Power at Work in You, 320 pages. That was nailed to the shelf. <laughs> so the Reader's Digest version <laughs> is called Unleashing God's Power in You, 130 pages. <laughs> <laughs> it probably has all the core stuff on it, so if you're interested in this, but it, it, it is a critical study. And, and the tragedy of it is, when I finally turned in my third edition, the opening line was, writing a book on sanctification is a hard sell. We took the line out. <laughs> I guess maybe I put it in there for my frustration. But if you think about it, how many people are passionately pursuing holiness? Honestly. So I asked the question, so what's in it for me? Can you think of a worse question to ask when you're writing a book on sanctification? With a buzzword today, is this all about God? <laughs> Actually, what's interesting about that is there is no sure commitment with no sure reward. And I think Scripture actually acknowledges that. The tragedy is, Paul himself says, godliness is a means of great gain. It's profitable for this age and the age to come. I think if we truly knew the truth, there would be no other path that we would go on. We don't quite see it, folks. I really believe that. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. So you're dissatisfied right now? Maybe you're on the wrong path. <laughs> now, before I add to the guilt here at all, <laughs> It is a very tough issue. I mean, if you had a well-advertised conference on holiness, how many people would show up in that show? How to be successful? Well, well, pile out like crazy. How to be prosperous? How to become a better materialist and enjoy God at the same time? Boy, that book would sell millions. <laughs> and um, I mean, honestly, I mean, I'm, we're, we're fighting human nature here in a lot of ways. It's, uh, and yet this is God's will for our life. And it's, and it's a difficult doctrine in one sense. I, I had a kind of a Christian leader, you probably heard of him, share with me years ago. He said, I can divide any seminary in the country in two doctrines. I said, really, what? He said, salvation and sanctification. I said, come on. <laughs> really? At the time, I was teaching evangelism at Talbot, and I wrote out a track, a gospel presentation. I said, if they call the school, this, and, I, and I sent it to all the faculty for feedback. Did I get feedback? Holy cow, I mean, everyone was marked up. Almost every one of them returned it back, marked up. Some hard over in Lordship Salvation, some over on Cheap Grace and everywhere in between. I couldn't believe it. So I thought I'd write one on sanctification. <laughs> Not. But, but why, is it, why would it, that be difficult? Well, uh, you could divide a group like this on this doctrine quite easily. Uh, in fact, let me do, these are caricatures. I'm not 
trying to nail anybody here. Uh, but do you know when it comes to Scripture, in terms of your own personal salvation right now, is past, present, and future tense? You have been saved, you are being saved, and someday you shall fully be saved? You have not yet experienced the totality of salvation? You won't until you have a resurrected body on the other side. Now, I personally believe that God has given me the Holy Spirit, a seal, a pledge, those are strong words, unto the day of redemption. And he writes these things that I may know that I have eternal life. So I think you can have the assurance of salvation today. I mean, you're either born again or you're not. You're either in the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of God or not. And, and so there's something definitive that happened the moment that you put your trust in Christ and were born again. No question about that. But you have not experienced the totality of salvation yet. What you do have is the assurance of that now, or should have it, you know, for the future. Sanctification is also past, present, and future tense. You have been sanctified. You are being sanctified. This is right in your English Bible. And if you want to get the little book, you'll see the scriptures that show this. So it's past, present, and future tense. Now that's not new. Because if you went to a good seminary, they would hopefully correctly point out that, that sanctification as a doctrine began at new birth and ends in glorification. So, scripturally, you have been sanctified, you are being sanctified, and someday you shall fully be sanctified. Now, contrast that with uh, regeneration, uh, justification for the believer, it's all past tense. You have been regenerated. You got the, the very life of Christ within you. You have been forgiven. And uh, that's, that's crystal clear. That's no confusion. Now, what's happened is, is, is that we referred to past tense as positional sanctification. Trust me, this is the most theological part of this whole 12, 13 weeks we have together. But hang with me, because I think it's very important to understand this growth process. Uh, Present tense has been called progressive sanctification or experiential sanctification. Now here's where you can divide the whole Christian community up into the holiness and reform. Holiness, your Nazarenes would be a good illustration of that. A lot of Pentecostals, for instance, uh, uh, kind of come under the rubric of the holiness movement. And uh, traditionally in the past, they have seen that almost exclusively as past tense. That you have been sanctified which in my estimation uh, can lead to some very serious errors. Uh, I literally had a man a few years back now come up to me and said, I haven't sinned in 20 years. I said, really, if I asked your wife, would she agree? He didn't know how to answer that. <laughs> the problem with that is if you say you have no sin, you're deceiving yourself. I mean, come on, folks, there's nobody here that's perfect. Uh, so sinless perfection doesn't seem to exist anywhere. Uh, except for Christ. And, uh, uh, and then you have reform thinking, which almost focuses, focuses exclusively on, on present tense. And so sanctification becomes synonymous with growth or maturity. If all you do is see that, what happens? Then you look at past tense as, well, that's just positional truth, as though it's not real truth. That's tragic. What happens then is you spend the rest of your life trying to become somebody you already are. Now, I don't say that lightly, folks. In our ministry, we've had the privilege to work with hurting people all over the world. And we found one common denominator. None of them knew who they were in Christ. nor understood what it meant to be a child of God. Now, why is that the case? If the Holy Spirit is bearing witness with my spirit, I'm a child of God, why weren't they sensing that? Where is it? Where's the new life? Where's the sense of forgiveness? Where's the sense that I'm essentially right with God, for that matter? So uh, you can get off balance on either side of this uh, in our way of thinking. Now here's my point, though, is that positional sanctification, past tense, is the basis for progressive. I'm not trying to become a child of God. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. See how great a love the fathers bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God? No, not later, no. Um, it's the basis for that. I am now a child of God who is becoming like Christ. Do you see the difference? I mean, in terms of living this out, it's huge. Because if you are firmly rooted in Christ, now this is where I would like you to take your Bibles if you haven't, and turn with me to 
Colossians chapter 2. And you can see Paul's whole idea of the progress of growth. Now, trust me, we're going to get to some very practical applications of this before this afternoon is done. And just to show you, this, this is no small thing. I told you my own journey. How may, I may have been taught theologically in seminary that I was a new creation in Christ, that I was alive in Him, that I'm a child of God. But on an experiential level in my own life, it's, it's like it was good theology, but nothing else. And uh, now, here's a little pastor who wrote me a note. He said, um, I've been reading your two books. That would be Victory Over Darkness and Bondage Breaker. I want to thank you for giving me two tools that I really needed. I'm the founding pastor of this church, having begun 16 years ago, and I find myself in the first steps of recovering from a church split. I've never known pain like this, but I'm finding it a tremendous time of learning and growth in the Lord. Your victory book has been especially helpful in that I've tried to find too much of my identity in what I do as a pastor and not enough in who I am as a saint. Oh, my dear friend, Dr. Sosi, and I came to that conclusion years ago. The greatest determinant of somebody's success in ministry is their personal identity and security in Christ. You can stand alone. You know who you are. Um, I mean, we're sending people overseas, the missionaries, and they're not rooted in Christ. It's like they don't even hardly know him. They know about him, but they may not know him. And uh, here's another illustration. This is classic because if you ask me in the 10 years I taught at the seminary, who would I expect to be the next uh, Dale Everest or Chuck Swindoll or somebody like that? This guy would probably at least be in my top five. Uh, he won our homiletics award, which is outstanding senior preacher. His grade point average is about perfect. He was at Christmas banquet entertainment two years in a, go, in a row. He was personable. He was intelligent. He was gifted. He had everything that you would kind of project. This guy is going to have a an incredible ministry. He was in ministry for two years and bombed out. And this very gifted, intelligent man wrote me this letter. I've always just figured I was a rotten, no good, dirty, stinking sinner, saved by grace, yet failing God miserably every day. And all I could look forward to was a lifetime of apologizing every night for not being the man I know he wants me to be. But I'll try harder tomorrow, Lord. As a firstborn trying so hard to earn the approval of highly expectant parents, I've related to God the same way. He just couldn't possibly love me as much as he does other better believers. Oh, sure, I'm saved by grace through faith, but really I'm just hanging on until he gets tired of putting up with me here and bring me home to finally stop the failure in progress. Wow. What a treadmill. Neil, when you said you're not a sinner, you're a saint in reference to a new primary identification, you totally blew me away. Isn't that strange that a guy could go clear through a good seminary and never really latch onto the truth that he is indeed a new creation in Christ? I'm convinced that old tapes laid down in early childhood can truly hinder our progress and understanding who we are in Christ. Comment on it. And uh, that'll be our subject for next week. And uh, so, I mean, these are pastors, people. These are gifted people. These are people who are educated. And um, just case in point, last March I was in England, you know, did a whole tour in Europe. And um, we had about 200 pastors up in the middle part of England for a couple of days. And, and uh, at the end of it, it was on discipleship counseling, what we're covering here. At the end of it, this pastor came up. He was probably in his early 60s, probably about my age. And he said, I've been doing seminars around the country on the Lord's Prayer. Tell him to pray our Father. Yesterday, for the first time, it connected that I'm his son. I've been calling him my father all those years. I mean, he was very sobered about it and, uh, and thankful at that time. But kind of, what, why didn't I, that didn't connect before? Now, he's been in ministry for years. And, and we've seen this. Uh, I mean, this is kind of the basis for overcoming a negative self-image, the little book we have out there. And a radio guy asked me, he said, how many people have this problem? I said, put your thumb on the globe, everybody underneath it. Isn't that true? Have you always felt great about yourself all your life, folks? Come on. There isn't a pastor, a counselor, a missionary in the world that when somebody comes in to see him as a hurting person, doesn't start out with the understanding this people, this person does not feel good about themselves. How do you overcome that? Well, you stroke one another's eagles and pick yourself up by your own bootstraps. Have you tried it? Doesn't work, does it? The more you keep telling that pretty little girl she's cute, the more you're going to have an anorexic. You're going to create a body cult 
instead of a true identity. So these are not small things, these are just huge and they play out in our life all the time. And uh, now, uh, let me illustrate this in another way. I, I was raised in Minnesota. Summer comes around the 4th of July and ends on the 5th. <laughs> and uh, I remember growing on that farm. By, by the way, I, I was born, physically born on a farm, delivered by my aunt, great aunt actually, who delivered my father on that same farm. And that's, that farm was settled by my grandfather from Norway. I walked a mile to country school that my grandfather built. Interesting natural heritage. And, uh, but we moved off of it. Dad had a wooden leg and, and we, we moved down to Arizona after my eighth grade. Oh, talk about a cultural shift for me. Uh, it was incredible. But uh, uh, I, I look back at that at my own personal natural heritage. You know, in a lot of ways I'm very thankful for it. Walked a mile to country school and you know, just had a, a very, very good upbringing for that matter. But I, I remember when we moved to Arizona, I was blown away by the fact that there were orange trees in the uh, boulevards of the streets and in the city parks and, and uh, I just couldn't believe that. Orange trees. I mean the oranges come around occasionally in Minnesota but you know ship there for two weeks you know during the season. But so I went and picked one and I took a bite and spit it out. It was an ornamental orange. Now how stupid is that? I mean you know if you're going to plant an orange tree why would you plant an ornamental orange? It's worse than a lemon. You can't eat it. Well I found out why. It's a much hardier stock uh, because it's not a sweet orange. And so that's why they will plant them in boulevards because they will survive a frost better and, and live better and they're much more hardier. And actually what they do is they will plant those in nurseries, beds, ornamental orange, and let it grow up about the size of your little pinky like that, cut it off and graft in a sweet orange, say a navel or Valencia orange. And uh, now what grows above the graft? Sweet orange, right? Uh, uh, what, what's the nature of the tree above the graft? It's only one nature. It's, and when people go down there, or oh, that, see that orange uh, grove over there? Actually, that's just a bunch of rootstock. They don't say it that way. No, they will say, no, that's navel oranges right there. That's Valencia oranges over there. How would they know it? By its, how would they know us? Now, think about this, folks. Uh, Paul says, I recognize no man, no woman, according to their flesh. And he never does, to my knowledge, in the New Testament. He never identifies you and I as believers for who we were in Adam. He doesn't identify us by our natural heritage. He identifies us for who we are in Christ. 1 Corinthians 4, he says, I submit to you my beloved brother Timothy, who will teach you my ways which are in Christ, which I teach to all churches all the time. In that way, I want to see myself as, as a modern-day Timothy. That's what I teach in all churches all the time. Brothers and sisters, you are alive in Christ. You are a new creation. Uh, the Bible does not recognize you for who you were in Adam. In fact, read it tonight, Romans chapter 8. If you're in the flesh, you are not a Christian. If you're a Christian, you are in Christ. And it's just all over. Once you see it, uh, you will find in the book of Ephesians alone, 40 times in Christ, in Him. That means your soul is in union with God. And what we're laboring under here in America is a third of the gospel. We presented Jesus as the Messiah who came to die for our sins. If we receive Him in our life and we die, we'll get to go to heaven. What's wrong with that? Well, number one, it would give you the impression that eternal life is something you get when you die. Not true. He who has the Son has the life. He who doesn't have the Son doesn't have the life. You see, what Adam and Eve lost in the fall was life. If they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they would die. Sin separated them, but what they lost was life, and what Jesus came to give us was life. You know, if you go back, and I have been recently, it's been kind of an interesting journey for myself to look at uh, the Orthodox faith and go back and reading a, a lot of the second, third century uh, writings of Athanasius and that. Oh, there's two things clearly. Clearly, constantly, repetitively throughout their things is, is that salvation is connecting with God, uh, that the whole incarnation is the whole issue, 
uh, that you're alive in Christ, and they had a worldview quite different from ours, folks. They understood that we were in a spiritual battle. And now why in the world we filtered off of that in our Western world, I don't know. But every defeated Christian I've dealt with doesn't know who they are in Christ. Why is that? As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. See how great a love of the fathers bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. Here we are searching for some identity in the world. I said, the only one that's going to be have a meaningful existence for you is to find out who you are in Christ, folks. Beloved, now, not later. Now you're our child of God. And if you want to save a dead man, what would you do? Give him life. Or he'd only die again. And we're all born dead in our trespasses and sins, right? And uh, so if you want to save a dead man and you come along and you give him life, he'd just die again. You'd have to do two things. You'd have to, first of all, cure the disease that caused him to die and the wages of sin is death. So Jesus went to the cross. He died for our sins. Is that the whole gospel? You know, thank God for Good Friday, folks. Don't get me wrong. But finish the verse. But the free gift of God is eternal life. On the resurrection and the life, he who believes in me will live even if he dies. He will live spiritually even if he dies physically. In fact, let me put it stronger than that. If you don't have eternal spiritual life before you physically die, all you can look forward to is hell. Isn't that true? That's only two-thirds of the gospel. 1 John 3 eight clearly says that Jesus came to undo the works of Satan. You can't have two sovereigns ruling in the same sphere at the same time. That question of authority, who has the right to rule, had to be solved. That's right. And, uh, and that's why he came, to undo the works of Satan. And when I go to third world countries, that's the gospel they're waiting to hear because they're out there trying to appease the deities by little baskets of fruit and, and trying to somehow manipulate the spiritual world with wish doctors and shamans. And when you tell them that they are disarmed in Christ and that you have authority over them, folks, that's just as much a part of the gospel as the fact that your sins are forgiven. And trust me, if you've never been there, that's the one they're waiting to hear because they're scared to stiff of, of uh, that spiritual world and there's no question in their mind that there is one. That's only us in the West that have that worldview. They've got one, folks, and it's frightening for them. Fear is the number one mental health problem of the world. And uh, we'll end our time with looking at fear. So this is critically important to understand this. Now, go back to my tree illustration. Uh, look at a tree. What potentially can come out of the roots? What do we call those? Suckers. You've heard that, right? What should you do with suckers? Well, cut them off. Why? Well, they'll just snuff out the life of the tree, actually. All the energy of growth will just go into those suckers. You'll end up with a bush that won't bear any fruit. So you've got to keep trimming those things off. Now you bring in the vine illustration in John 15. You've got the same illustration, don't you? What should you do with vines that aren't producing fruit? You trim them off. You cut them off. Uh, otherwise, you will just crowd out the fruit-bearing nature of the vine or of the, of the tree. Now here's where it gets sticky in... Two of you may be interested in this, but 30 seconds here. There's kind of a debate that's been raging for a long time. Does a Christian have one or two natures? And the major problem here is the confusion, I think, of terms. Uh, nature, uh, old man or old self, and flesh are not equivalent terms. Start there. Uh, the word nature, actually, in terms of human nature it only occurs twice. You were, past tense, by nature, children of wrath. For, uh, Second Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 4 says, you have become now a, div a partaker of the divine nature. Now, nature implies essence. Unfortunately, if you have an NIV Bible, they translated flesh as old or sin nature. Everybody that I know in theological circles is upset with, to that day with that. That has really confused the matter. But just be aware of that. Uh, sometimes they will say in the side or flesh or something. But, but uh, now the reason I say that is, is that the old man is dead. You're not an Adam. I'll come back to that next week. The new man is here. Okay, you're a new creation in Christ, but the flesh remains. So you and I continue to battle the flesh, and we'll try to explain that a, a little bit. But the only reason you can battle it is because you're a new creation in Christ. And frankly, that's the only reason you can live or have any chance to live a righteous life. Now, um, 
So it's paradoxical in one way because Paul identifies us for who we are in Christ. When he identifies the tree, he identifies it by the fruit. He's only looking at that which is above the graft. But since I'm still in a natural body, when you look at the whole tree, how many natures does it have? It actually has kind of two because uh, you still have this natural body. Now that'll enter into our thinking here very profoundly in, in the days ahead as well, especially when we look at sexual sins. I mean, this will be critical, so just kind of keep this in mind for a moment. Now that's about as technical as I'm going to get, okay? We're going to get very practical here in a moment uh, of why then aren't people growing. Now, uh, there's another aspect of this I want you to see. Because, uh, have we read Colossians 2? Let me look at this. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk. How? What's your Bible say? In Him. Uh, having been firmly rooted and now being built up, how? In Him. And established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. Now here is what separates totally Christian discipleship from secular mentoring, uh, Christian counseling from secular counseling. It's almost like a parenthetical insertion. It says, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophies and empty deception according to the tradition of man, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. Now he comes back to Christ again. For in him, Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. Now, here's Paul's process of growth. You have to first be firmly rooted in Christ in order to be built up in him, in order to live in him. In other words, there is something foundational that has to be laid upon which you grow, and then as you grow, you're more able, essentially, to live and to minister and to serve Him, right? I mean, this is just natural growth concepts. Is it a fair assumption to assume that all the people going to our Bible-believing churches are firmly rooted in Christ? Bad assumption. <laughs> Man, I, I kind of started with that, and I think a lot of churches do, that... Uh, Gee, everybody there knows who they are in Christ. You know, they're firmly rooted in Him. And uh, now how do you get firmly rooted in Him is the big question. Because my experience is if you're not, you're not growing. You may have the best intentions of the world, but you're not growing. Now, I want you to see this because it's just critical. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. But I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food. Now, I'm not sure what your translation says. Listen to what he's saying here. For you were not yet able to receive it. Not unwilling. Unable. Indeed, even now you are not yet able, for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like mere men? Now, think with me for a moment, just logically. Just based on this passage alone, you would have to conclude the fact that if you've got that kind of carnality, if people got those kind of unresolved issues in their life, they're not going to grow. They're not able to receive it. I've seen that all over the world. We had 4,200 folks in the Philippine Convention Center for a week, all Christian leaders, probably one of the most impacting weeks of my life. And uh, we got to what we talk about next Tuesday night, that mental strongholds, that battle for the mind. 20% went out just like that. I mean, I didn't really see it because it was a huge auditorium. And, and people come up afterwards and said, you lost. I mean, I heard that from so many people. They, and they wanted to be there. Some of them had traveled hours and days and whatever else. They just, boom. I've seen people sit in my office, read of scripture, tell me later. I heard, I saw your lips move, but I didn't even hear a word you were saying. I had a principal of a school in um, Central California. I was teaching in Talbot. Um, superintendent of the school district, principal of a high school. Forty-some-year-old man, well-respected in his community, went to church, had a Bible study in his home, called me one day and said, I'm in deep trouble. He said, uh, if I drove down, it was about a six-hour drive, he said, would you spend some time? And I assured him I would. He knew somebody at Swindoll's church in Fullerton at that time to spend the night. 
And I send them a set of tapes and resolve a personal and spiritual conflicts. And I said, on your ride down, listen to this. I want you to understand this battle for your mind. I want you to understand who you are in Christ. And he said, I'll do that. So he put in the tapes and drove down. Walked in my office, handed me the tapes, and said they're all blank. None of them were. Listen to the same set all the way home. Uh, and I've just seen this all over the place. I, I just I want you to, to, to hear me in a concerned way. There are literally masses in our churches. Whatever we're sharing Sunday morning is going right over their head. They're coming back the next week, the next month, and the next year, same old person they were before. In fact, when I first started doing this publicly some time ago, <laughs> um, I used to ask pastors. I, I said, after a conference, I said, what percentage of your Christians are living a fruitful life, are growing, are bearing fruit? Sure, they have problems, but they work through them, they grow through them. What percentage of, of our people? You know what I used to hear 15 years ago? 15%. Almost consistently. Nobody ever said in all that time, ever, ever more than 20%, are living a productive Christian life, who are growing, have a devotional life, prayer life, bearing fruit. You know what I'm here now? Consistently. Five. That's tragic to me. Being alive and free in Christ is the birthright of every child of God. What's missing? Predominantly, repentance. No repentance, no change. Now see, positionally, they may be in Christ. They, they may have jumped through the hoops. They may have made that decision. I'm not questioning these people's salvation. But why aren't they growing? Uh, I used to say to my students at the seminary, I said, when you get out in ministry, the greatest asset you'll have in your church is mature saints. Don't alienate them. They may take you off for lunch someday and suggest ways you grow up. Listen to them. <laughs> you know, they're not against you. They're, they're concerned about you. I said, but it's the greatest asset you will have in your church is mature saints. Greatest liability you'll have in your church are saints that get old but don't mature. All they want to do is censor. You can't do that around here, young man. We've never done it that way before. They'll kill the church. It's not their fault. If, if I point a finger anyway, it would be right back at higher education. It would be people like me. We've given them the wrong goal, folks. The goal of our instruction is love. It's not knowledge that makes them arrogant. It's love. In fact, I'll go so far as to say that you continue to educate people in knowledge beyond their maturity. You're going to have a noisy gong and a clinging cymbal. You're going to have problems in your church you wish you'd never had to come across. And all it leads to is intellectual arrogance. And Scripture clearly teaches that. In fact, that is the most disillusioning thing of Christianity. It's not the moral failures that's so unexplainable, but the intellectual arrogance that seems to accompany higher education. I'm right. Oh, shut up. Look at your face. You're all screwed up. Let <laughs> 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 a guy come to me one time and said, who we got of scholarship? He, seminary prof. And I said, oh, you're looking at the wrong guy, man. I got five degrees and 25 years of formal education. My daughter put that in perspective, by the way. She said, Dad, I figured out. You have 25 years of formal education. Man, that's a mistake I'm not going to make. <laughs> She's not impressed. <laughs> Neither is the devil, I want you to know. Uh, not in the least. It, uh, boy, boy, get a godly person praying. Yeah. He's impressed. You had a godly person who knows who he's in Christ. He's, he's, he's afraid. I remember your years on when I first learned this stuff. People would have all these voices and things in their head, and they said, they're all afraid of you. And boy, now watch out for that one. That could lead you on an eagle trip. I said, they're not afraid of me. They just know who I, they know who I know I'm in Christ. That's it. Remember the seven sons of Sceva? Jesus we know, Paul, we heard of. Who are you? Beat him up, stripped him of the clothes, and kicked him out. Trying to somehow do God's work by some magic formulas or something. What would you uh, do if somebody said that to you? I said, I'm a child of God. That's who I am. You can't touch me. It's 1 John 5, 18. You should know that verse. You should know it well. 1 John 5, 18. I'm begotten to God. The evil one cannot touch me. And boy, the more that you know that, the last thing the devil wants you to know 
is who God is, and the second thing is who you are. Yeah. But boy, if you knew who, if you really knew God, and you knew yourself, who you are as a child of God, you're an instrument now in God's hand. Everything hangs on those two beliefs, by the way. Um, because the whole plan of God is to reestablish this fallen humanity and present us pure, spotless, and undefiled. So if you know who you are in Christ, you can stand. And we'll do what we can to help you in that regard. Now this is a serious, serious thing. I, I'm not saying this lightly. I do doctrine and ministry classes in several different seminaries. And I've, I've given them, you know, I said, hypothetically, you gave a stirring message Sunday morning. I mean, people were moved. And the Spirit of God was moving people. And you call them to come forward to repent. Gave them a card. I said two questions. One, what would they do? Number two, what should they do? Now these are pastors who all have their masters of divinity. They've all taken Greek, probably. Uh, I'm sure they know the definition of repentance. Literally, it means change of mind. You think you'd have some great agreement, right? We don't know what to do. What would they do? Well, they may start confessing their sin. Is that repentance? No. If that's all they're doing, they're going to get in the sin, confess, sin, confess, sin, confess, right. and I give up. Cycle. Which is where most are at. Uh, what a challenge. The worst challenge of it is, where are even the opportunities to do that? Think about it. Is this an obscure thing? But didn't John the Baptist say, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand? Didn't Paul tell us to repent and believe? Where's the repentance? Where's the changed life? And George Barnett keeps doing studies saying the lifestyle of our Christians basically is almost indistinguishable from the world. Thank you, George Barnett. I stopped reading him a long time ago. It was discouraging. Because <laughs> I'm more on the correction side of this thing. Let's see if we can do something to change all of that. Well, let me, let me illustrate this. In, uh, in, in, in my observation, what I think is maybe gone wrong in, in, a, in a large cultural sense. But it, it's actually kind of true all over the world. Uh, if this is God's goal for our life, if, if what we're trying to do in our churches is help our people conform to the image of God once they're in Christ, and then everybody here has got a, the very base of what we're doing in our churches, we want to see people grow, don't we? Shouldn't we be able to say, I'm more loving this year than last year, more kind, more patient, have more self-control? If I can't say that, I'm not growing. Don't talk to me about knowledge. Scripture doesn't acknowledge that. Scripture clearly says, you know, the Beatitudes, the fruit of the Spirit, that's the evidence of growth. So we should be more loving, shouldn't we? More kind, more patient. I mean, case in point, we lost the abortion debate publicly. Do you know why, I think? Can't tell one from the other if you didn't read the placard. They both were two angry group of people. If the Christians had stood there and had a silent vigil, said nothing, we'd have been so much better off. But instead, we looked just like them. I'm not trying to be judgmental, but didn't we? Just this angry set of beliefs and this angry set of beliefs. If we just had a silent vigil and just sat there and prayed, I think we could have turned the stem of the time, but we, some of them even shot the doctors. I mean, jeez. In the name of Christianity. God help us. Unbelievable. I see that greatest test that you'll have in your Christian growth is can I maintain my place in Christ in public or will I fall back to my flesh patterns? When you're under fire, can the fruit of the Spirit continue to be evident in your life or you fall back to flesh patterns? That's the biggest, I've, I've been there, folks, so many times. I remember one time, the, uh, when I was still teaching at Talbot, the head of the philosophy department, Cal State Dominguez Hills, called me and asked if I'd be willing to debate for the man from the American, uh, American Civil Liberties Union on school prayer. Well, I really wasn't too much behind any formal <laughs> school prayer, but I said I'd like to have him the freedom to be able to. He said, that's enough of a difference. So I agreed. My wife wouldn't even go and witness the carnage, by the way. And uh, <laughs> turned out he was president of the Orange County Atheistic Society. And Joanne says, you got to be an idiot. These people are pros at this stuff. You, you're not a debater. I said, 
They're just giving me a public platform to share the love of Christ. That's all. And uh, so I went over there and I met him beforehand. I said, Dr. Goldberg, I said, are you Jewish? No. Goldberg? <laughs> he said, I never fraternized with the enemy before a debate. I said, an enemy? I said, how am I your enemy? He walked away. Well, they gave me 10 minutes, and see what they do, they'll set up a stooge. Now, I kind of knew this, and there was a guy 60 years old right in front of me, you know, when it come to questions, and I waved him. <laughs> I had you another. And uh, so they gave me 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 5 minutes, 5 minutes, 1 minute, 1 minute, and then they opened up for questions. God is always good. I didn't know Campus Crusade had called their meeting that night, and I had 60 out there who went after that guy. And you know what I wanted to have happen? Happen. His character revealed itself. He got angry, calling names, whatever. And at the end of it, he just left, and we had a coffee time after. There was about six, 700 people out there. And uh, they all came up to me, that was great. You just kept sitting up there smiling. <laughs> <laughs> That's the contest. Can I maintain my position in Christ under fire? Can I continue to be the person God created me to be? Can I not lose that? Or will I fall back into flesh patterns? And, and boy, it's easy. I mean... There's times when you really want to. I mean, I mean, humanly, you kind of... Anyway. Okay, look at happens. Take a passage like Luke 2.52. The Lord continued to grow in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Now, we want a balanced life, and I think the Lord modeled that for us. And so, in uh, wisdom, mental and stature, physical and favor with God and man, spiritual, social. And based on that, in our Christian experience, wanting to be holistic and encompass all things of life... We develop what I call a lot of personal disciplines in our life, or at least make some attempt to, the, to do that. And so mentally we study and we think and meditation and solitude and prayer and fellowship. And I mean, just let's call it a, a whole balanced life. And um, honestly, if you've been in ministry as long as I have, I've given a message or written a book or something, probably every one of those. Um, but something's wrong. Uh, it's like spokes in a wheel. Uh, and I think the result is, is we end up with a subtle form of Christian behavioralism. That sounds like this. You ought not to do that. You ought to do that. That's not the best way to do it. Here's a better way to do it. Okay, I'll try. <laughs> and we're huffing and puffing ourselves into burnout. And, and it's not working, but it never will work. It never has worked. Um... Or simply reintroducing the law is not the answer, folks. The law kills, but the Spirit gives life. Mm -hmm. And um, now I think the reason we've done this somewhat, I mean, most of us are kind of pragmatic by nature, and we want to know how to do the Christian life, and so we get all these how-to things. And chances are, and chances are I go back to higher education again, because, you know, been there, done that, you want to write your thesis or your dissertation, and so you do studies on some of the problems that we have in this world, and we look to the Bible to find God's answer for it. So if you want to be a good father or a good mother, you know, child, whatever, what happens is, is that your concordance will direct you to some Old Testament passages and the second half of Paul's epistles. Let me explain that. If you took a, a New Testament class in any seminary, yeah, the Greek prof would correctly point out that Paul's epistles are divided almost down the middle. The first half is theological, and the second half is practical. I mean, where does he talk about marriage and work and that? Isn't this the second half? And so here's the subtle part about it is when you actually look and saw what that person wrote, and you say, is that right according to Scripture? Yes, it's correct. Boy, he took Ephesians 5, he tore that thing apart, he looked at the culture at that time, because his hermeneutic, he wanted to be grammatically, historically correct, and this is how they would have understood it then, and so we can make these applications today, and you look at it, and it's right, then why isn't it working? Well, let me illustrate that with marriage. Let me, let me just look at my take on our culture. You look at somebody who's raised in the 40s and 50s, and... Uh, Really very thankful for that, by the way. 50s was probably the best ten decade in America, I mean, in our own history. Music was decent, you know. Uh, people went to church. Uh, it, it was a great time. And um, Tom Brokaw wrote The Greatest Generation. I actually think he was kind of right. My, my parents, essentially, who survived the war, the Great Depression and all that, grew out of that crisis. And, and um, 
And at that time, in 1960, there was a study that said if a family prayed together, had devotions together, only one in a thousand separated. Think about that. Don't hear that anymore, do we? <laughs> you know, the national average for divorce is about 50% secularly, about 40% for Christians. And uh, then the 60s came, free sex and drugs and the Beatles and the music and all that changed. And, you know, the baby boomer, buster, Generation X, all that stuff. We're not going to go there. But it layered our culture. And what happened was, I think seminaries got caught a little flat-footed in terms of, uh, of preparing people for ministry. Because I remember even in the late 60s when I went to seminary, you know, you, you wanted to have this Christ-centered ministry. And even at that time, if you were preaching to a congregation where you understood that mom and dad were only married once and to each other and had 2.2 kids, uh, you were talking to about 8% of your population. And it's much less than that now. Where, where dad works, mom stays home, raises the children, no divorce, children raised by godly mom and dad. That's less than 5% of our population. And uh, so what happened was degreed programs sprung up across our country uh, in marriage, family, and child counseling. Back in those days, discipleship was big. Navigators was doing well. I personally cut my teeth on uh, 10 Basic Steps to Christian Maturity, uh, the 2 7 series for Navigators, the Design for Discipleship. Good stuff, good theology. You know what? What's interesting, the first introduction in uh, discipleship counseling, it worked for me. You know why? I never smoked, never drank, didn't have sex outside of marriage. <laughs> I'm talking now less than 1% of our population. 50% of your 20-year-olds in this country have a sexually transmitted disease. 50%. Not had sex, have a sexually transmitted disease. Actually, 120 million Americans do. We got a problem, folks. We'll get to that later. But, uh, uh, so, by the way, who taught pastoral counseling and discipleship you know, back in the 60s? Oh, godly pastors who knew the Bible, knew how to pray and read and teach. And, and so what happened? These degree programs sprung up. And, of course, you had to have a, a degree. So what Christian schools were given PsyDs, doctor of psychology? Answer, none. There were none. There's only a handful today. So all of these people came into our seminaries with secular degrees. In fact, I remember when I first went to Talbot to teach, we had a, a group of us on our day of indoctrination, and the, uh, uh, one of the faculties was introduced, uh, going to teach at Rosemead Graduate School of Psychology. And oh, by the way, you were our newest Christian too, just last year, right? I sat there horrified. I mean, I didn't know anything what I know now, but I, at the time I thought, poor lady, how in the world in one year's time could she get grounded in her face so she'd have a biblical understanding of who we are? I got to know her later. She's a nice person, growing in the Lord. But I said, all of her concept of who you are is all secular. Now hear me on this. Am I against psychology? Come on, think about this. Psychology, by definition, is a study of the soul. Am I against that? Of course not. But I think there's a very biblical psychology. I think God has clearly defined who we are. Uh, clearly, not, not, not obscurely, talks about our heart. Get there in a moment. Clearly identify this. And uh, I'm against a secular th psychology like I would be against a liberal theology. But come on, folks, you can't be against psychology as a concept. That's just a part of our systematic theology, actually. Clearly understanding who we are, what man is. Who am I, God, that you would consider me? The psalmist asked.